Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Thompson. And for the next 40 minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning in medical imaging and genomics, and really talk about some lessons we've learned in Enigma's global studies of brain diseases. So a quick summary of the talk is as follows. Um, first of all, we'll talk about why we might want to use artificial intelligence in medical imaging. I'll give you some example applications from Alzheimer's disease research in our AI for AD project. I'll tell you for about 15 minutes about Enigma, which is performing global studies of over 30 brain diseases, and also about some global studies of imaging and genetics, which largely use meta-analysis. And then for the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about some challenges applying artificial intelligence and machine learning methods to multi-site data. Uh, some of them include handling domain shift. Uh, we'll talk about different data harmonization approaches, combat, hierarchical Bayesian analysis, generative adversarial networks, variational autoencoders. Uh, many of these are very useful uh, for um, combining and pooling data from multiple sites and also for deconfounding, which I'll also talk about. And towards the second half of the talk, we'll talk about some really powerful new mathematics. Uh, many of you know about CNNs, RNNs, BAEs, and GANs. Um, a lot of interesting ideas coming from information theory, such as al algorithmic fairness. And also we'll touch on federated deep learning and its variants and some encryption methods that uh, are used for secure multi-party computation. So I'll tell you a little bit about some image analysis challenges that come from two multi-site initiatives. Um, Enigma is a global brain imaging study uh, where we look at how 30 major brain diseases affect the brain across 45 countries and what factors affect uh, patient outcomes. And this has led to the largest neuroimaging studies of now 13 major brain disorders, as well as studies that screen the genome for genetic markers that affect the brain. And one study recently in science uh, aggregated data from 60 cohorts around the world that had brain imaging and genetic data. Another project I'll talk about is AI for AD, um, which is all about using deep learning in AI for uh, diagnosis, prognosis, and discovery of factors that affect disease progression in Alzheimer's disease. And the latter project, AI for AD, some of the people involved in this, many of them uh, you, you might be known to you, uh, are shown here. So one way of using deep learning in AI, uh, particularly in Alzheimer's disease, is to take all of the aggregated biomarker data that you have from a large number of patients, uh, genetic data, omics data, uh, neuroimaging, even real-time data such as actigraphy, and try and build a mathematical model or a predictive model that will help to predict uh, diagnosis or prognosis or what the likely treatment response is uh, for new patients. Um, obviously, AI methods can discover and learn patterns in biobanks of data from patient populations, including predictors that we may not have thought about. And in dementia research, there's a, a lot of interest in training methods to do diagnosis and subtyping of dementia, uh, looking at the different processes, amyloid, tau, uh, atrophy, and vascular disease that uh, can often be mixed, and having the algorithm uh, discover these and, and use them to predict uh, treatment response. Some of the methods we use include convolutional neural networks, uh, generative adversarial networks, which are really terrific for working with images, and also for genome sequences, recurrent neural networks. Um, many of you are familiar with these. Um, if we were developing a, a system to detect um, a person called Sarah, uh, we might have a number of images of her and images of other people, and we'd have a binary classifier that would essentially extract higher and higher order uh, kernels or features uh, from the images and, and, and essentially build an inference engine that's able to uh, tell whether uh, an image is her. In the context of medical imaging, the same applies, except it's in 3D. We might want to predict uh, the, the patient's diagnosis, what types of pathology they have, or even something simple like their age, which would be a test that's useful for, for benchmarking. And again, uh, the idea might be to say whether a person has Alzheimer's disease or vascular pathology or something else, uh, are they amyloid positive, which is important for uh, new drugs that are being developed to combat uh, amyloid accumulation in the brain? And also, we might want to discover some other pathologies. So one important project uh, led by Dugu Tosun at UCSF has intended to subtype brain pathology by pairing in vivo neuroimaging data with uh, post-mortem autopsy pathology data. Now, for most patients, obviously, we don't have this. But the fact that you can train a classifier to learn what types of cellular pathology uh, are present is very, very useful uh, in understanding disease in, in, in living patients. Uh, this uh, multi-label random forest classifier uh, was trained uh, and in, in test data um, was 86 to 89% accurate uh, in detecting these different types of 
of pathology. This is useful, obviously, for uh, identifying subgroups of treatment responders that might be likely to respond to a treatment and drug trial, and also to stratify uh, disease to identify risk factors in the genome and environment uh, that might be easier to find if we disentangle the biology. A really remarkable study by Xiao Ganyan and Bin Lu at Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing uh, aggregated data from 217 scanners, uh, 85,000 brain scans from 50,000 people. And they trained an artificial neural network, again, a CNN, uh, that was based on the Inception ResNet version 2 network um, to, to detect Alzheimer's disease. It's again a, a classifier. But what was different here is that they pre-trained it using transfer learning on a sex classification task, just telling if the person is female or male from their MRI. It was 94.9% .9 accurate on that task. And then they fine-tuned it with transfer learning uh, to classify AD uh, with 91.3% accuracy. Really, really tremendous study. Now, these methods were not always popular. So I just want to tell you a quick story. My very first graduate student ever, Alain Pitio, um, was collaborating with uh, the INRIA EPIDAR team in 1998. And he was developing um, neural network methods for segmentation of MRI. And I remember a collaborator saying, well, we're a bit skeptical about this. Can we see how it works? There's no simple closed form analytic model for defining, uh, in this case, the corpus callosum on MRI. And at that time, it was much more popular to be using deformable templates or level sets or other classical um, methods from differential geometry and PDEs. And there was a little bit of skepticism that we wouldn't uh, be able to understand why uh, these methods were making the decisions that they do. So more recently, there's been huge attention to explainable AI. So the efforts to sort of discover, visualize, and understand the predictors. And secondly, to understand how the models work. Uh, some of these methods use um, attention uh, guided networks um, to discover patterns in the images that are being used uh, for make, making predictions. Um, also, uh, ablation of features in the image to find uh, important aspects uh, that, are, that are useful for making predictions. And this is really helping to discover uh, features that we never would have suspected were there in making diagnostic uh, decisions. Also, uh, even more complex are generative adversarial networks for harmonizing and adjusting images. So you can also change images in your study to match uh, the contrast of images from another study, the, the um, deep learning methods might generalize better if the contrast is adjusted. And this method by Sobi Sinha in, in, in our lab essentially uses uh, cycle GANs to adjust batches of MR data uh, to match a reference uh, cohort. And she's shown that for Alzheimer's disease classification, this is useful. It boosts classification accuracy in this case by uh, eight or 9% in terms of balanced accuracy. So later on, we'll talk a little bit about these. So a quick detour to tell you about Enigma. So Enigma is combining neuroimaging data from now 500 uh, sites. We have to deal with data from multiple scanners, multiple protocols across the world, studying multiple diseases. And the analysis options include meta-analysis, where you derive the measures at each site. Uh, you don't need to centralize the data, and everyone uses the same analysis protocol and, and basically meta-analyzes the data. Also, you can use mega-analysis, where you bring all the data to one site, and in that case, data harmonization methods uh, that are more sophisticated can be used. Or finally, federated learning, where you use distributed computation to perform uh, deep learning or machine learning on remote data. So since 2009, Enigma has published the largest neuroimaging studies of now 13 brain disorders. The goal has been to discover factors that help or harm the brain. And we've been analyzing brain scans and genomic data from now over 100,000 people in 45 countries. Uh, now there are over 2,000 scientists participating. And some of the largest studies have been done of Parkinson's epilepsy and ataxia in, in neurology, bipolar, major depression, schizophrenia, PTSD, and substance use in, in psychiatry and a range of neurodevelopmental uh, and infectious diseases. So in analyzing 100,000 brain scans, there's been two main goals. One is to understand how 33 major disorders of the brain affect the brain based on MRI, DTI, resting state functional MRI, and even EG and MEG. And also a really tricky problem of understanding how genetic variation, uh, in, in variation in our DNA affects the brain. So we screen millions of genetic markers across the genome using genome-wide association studies or even epigenome-wide association to find genetic markers and other factors that might affect the brain's development, uh, aging, and, and treatment response. Now, the amount of data is very useful uh, for reasons of statistical power, uh, tackling new types of questions like cracking the brain's genetic code. Also, the efficiency, if you can use massive distributed computation, uh, you can use cooperative machine learning uh, approaches and novel mathematics. 
And then finally, the social aspect, the sort of collective intelligence of all the people looking at the data that can improve uh, our methods as well. So here's where the data is. It's all over the world. Uh, the colors represent the different diseases that are being studied. Uh, there are many of them. Um, and obviously, you know, with this number of scientists involved, there has to be a coordinated way of analyzing the data, which I'll talk about next. So there's been a couple of reviews of Enigma. You're welcome to have a quick look through these. Um, the work is organized uh, by working groups. There are over 30 clinical working groups, each of them studying a different disorder with the same techniques. You'll see a number of groups uh, focusing on neurological and psychiatric disorders or neurodevelopmental disorders. Even within these uh, conditions, there are many subtypes. So brain injury, uh, Enigma's group on that uh, has a military uh, component, a sports related component, uh, uh, concussion and brain injury that can arise in different contexts with different causes and consequences. And also methodological groups that analyze and harmonize the data are divided into uh, distinct data types. So obviously there are analytic pipelines for diffusion imaging, resting state EEG, also for genome-wide association. And these allow a, a harmonized analysis to be performed on data uh, that's around the world. So here's just a picture of all the working groups and the methods at the top there that are being used and applied uh, to the data. Uh, and obviously a, a picture of many of the people that lead some of these analyses, uh, many of them uh, you might know. Now, the way that the work is organized is that if a group is studying a certain disease, and these dots here are different scientists studying the disease working together, there may be a disease that's being studied with MRI, DTI, and resting state functional MRI, but other diseases might be uh, reasonable to study with the same methods. And you can imagine a network, in fact, a modular hierarchical network of scientists that um, develop uh, analytic pipelines and apply them to multiple diseases. And then the lines are collaborations between them where they're comparing information across disorders, uh, imaging modalities, um, and even across continents and cultures uh, as well. So here's what Enigma members do, uh, first of all. So they'll compute brain measures from their brain scans. If it's MRI, they might use FreeSurf, or if it's DTI, they might use uh, TBSS, part of the FSL toolkit. They'll then, at each site, test associations between the brain measures and interesting factors, either diagnosis of disease or clinical measures or risk factors, or maybe modulators such as treatment that we want to see if they have a consistent uh, effect worldwide. Each site runs a multiple regression. They adjust the regression for age and sex and other confounds. And then when they've estimated uh, the effect of a certain factor of interest, they meta-analyze uh, the effects across the sites. And each site's vote depends on how much data they have. Um, this makes sure that the effects are reproducible and obviously gives us power that uh, working with one site's data would, uh, would not give us. And this led to very, very large studies. Uh, these are uh, maps of cortical thickness reductions uh, in major depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and many other disorders. The colors are the effect size for the difference between patients and controls. And you can see very, very different patterns depending on the disorder. Um, we can also send you a t-shirt with the data on uh, showing the different patterns that there are. And I think if we're to look at uh, the results, these are morphometric studies looking at the thickness of cortical gray matter in different disorders. You can see immediately that um, very, very complex patterns are characteristic of the different disorders. Um, some of them are expected, uh, others of them are unexpected. Uh, in some conditions, such as uh, autism spectrum disorder, there's not a reduction in gray matter, there's actually an excess, there's more gray matter than in, in, in typical controls. And I think by doing these studies with the same harmonized analysis, you begin to see uh, characteristic patterns uh, that are interesting for distinguishing the disorders from each other. And in fact, if you do that, if you measure, in this case, subcortical morphometry of the brain, you'll see characteristic differences uh, in the disease effects across schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, and ADHD. Now, when this is done in other countries, this study uh, used the same methods and pipelines. It was led by Ryota Hashimoto in the Kokoro Consortium in Japan. Exactly the same uh, pattern of results were found. And so what's interesting is if you rank the brain metrics for effect sizes for differences, in this case uh, in schizophrenia, the rank order of brain measures, these are subcortical volume measures, uh, is found to be almost exactly the same whether the study is done across Enigma or an independent data from Japan. That's very interesting that it replicates uh, so well. And just to be specific about what's happening, people scan schizophrenia patients and controls at all these sites. They run um, FreeSurfer or another analytic pipeline on their data, and they separately run regressions that might ask whether any of the factors shown here 
influence the brain. And then they meta-analyze uh, the data that comes out of it. And this um, can be shown as a forest plot. The cohorts are, uh, are being shown here. And the little bars there are the effects um, of differences between patients and controls. In this case, um, the volume of the fusiform gyrus or the cortical thickness, in fact, which shows a difference in 25 of 33 cohorts. And then when meta-analyzed, it becomes really quite a dramatic effect. And so you can map these, obviously, and meta-analyze the disease effects and show them uh, on the brain. This can be done voxel-based too. So Matthew Kempton uh, and the OCD working group in Enigma meta-analyzed data from 31 sites um, to understand the effects of OCD uh, on the brain, here showing gray, gray matter density reductions that are quite consistent uh, as you add data from more and more sites. Some disorders are progressive. Uh, the Parkinson's group split their data into Hon and Yar stages. Um, there are different disease uh, stages in Parkinson's disease. And one of the things that they were able to do is identify characteristic patterns uh, by meta-analyzing data from patients at different stages of clinical disease severity. Uh, the Clinical High Risk for Psychosis uh, Working Group, led by uh, Mar Maria Jalbozikowski and Dennis Hernaus, asked the question, were there any, any regions of interest that predicted uh, future development of psychosis? And there were. I mean, one of them that you see here is in the temporal lobe, measures from the temporal lobe predicted future development of psychosis, again, by meta-analyzing uh, data from people who did versus those who didn't develop psychosis and looking at what the differences ended up being. This can also be applied to the cerebellum, uh, the ataxia working group, um, categorized people with ataxia into early versus late onset uh, groups and, and also patients that had had the disorder for different durations. And as you can see, there's a, a great interest in stratifying this data and looking at the characteristic patterns at different stages. Now, this can also be applied to genetics. So we can discover um, individual changes in our genetic code that uh, influence the brain if we have enough data. Um, one model is to use regression. Uh, at every base pair in the genome, the nucleotide that's present might be variable uh, from one subject to another. But if we um, take a brain measure, it might be the overall size of the brain, and see if the nucleotide at each base location can predict it, uh, you can make an assertion for every point on the genome as to whether it's influential for that particular trait. So same idea again, everyone uh, genotypes their patients this time, tests associations with genetic markers, and meta-analyzes the effects. And actually, this was extremely successful in discovering markers in the genome that affect cortical morphometry. As you move around the cortex, these are actually surface area me measures for each region. And the little Manhattan plot uh, on the x-axis indicates locations on chromosome 15, uh, where single letter variations in the genetic code um, are associated with differences in the surface area of that part of the brain. And as you travel around the cortex, and for that matter, the rest of the brain, uh, the genetic markers vary a little bit. And you can make uh, composite genetic maps of the influential loci. Um, extremely interesting to look into these, whether they cluster in certain parts of the genome. And also for subcortical morphometry, um, there's a really complex mosaic of genetic markers that have been discovered uh, to be associated with volumes of these different parts of the brain. Um, they are now uh, very plentiful. Um, and if you sum up uh, the individual genetic loci to see if we can get a good polygenic predictor of regional brain volumes, uh, you find that you can. So this most recent work finds that 5% uh, of the variance in the volumes of subcortical structures, such as the hippocampus, many of them implicated in neurological and psychiatric disease, uh, these can be explained uh, by uh, simply looking at the genetic code, which you can measure from a, a saliva sample. Another application very interesting for drug companies is to uh, look at people who've been scanned twice, look at the rate or speed of brain aging, and see if there are any um, markers in the genome that influence that. Um, this is a study by Rachel Brower and Hilke Holsoff poll where 10,000 people were scanned twice. Uh, 37 cohorts of data were used. And um, one of the things that you see in this is that there are markers in the genome that affect uh, the rate of brain change all the time. Uh, some only act during early development and some only act during uh, aging. So this is very, very interesting as targets uh, for drug companies that want to influence uh, the degeneration uh, of the brain. So I'm going to move into a more mathematical mode and say that beyond meta-analysis, which has been used in the studies I've just described, you can centralize the individual data, uh, either the scans or the anonymized individual measures, and do some better modeling uh, of the effects of the site and the scanner uh, on, on the data. 
Um, because the data comes from different sources, we can even use uh, adversarial methods uh, to harmonize data to make it more comparable uh, from different sites. Or you can leave the data remote and use federated learning and distributed computation, which we'll talk about a little bit. So Andre Zugman at NIMH uh, wrote a really nice paper talking about um, how there were four ways to analyze multi-site neuroimaging data. Um, the first one, which is very old fashioned, is you don't analyze the data at all. You just look up the effect sizes of published studies. If you want to see if uh, having anxiety uh, is associated with brain differences, you might look up studies that have looked at that before. Number two actually coordinates the analysis. Everyone reanalyzes their data with the same analysis protocol, but they only send the summary statistics uh, to a central site that was used in the genome wide association studies that I've mentioned. But better still, you could be sent the individual measures derived from images, or even number four, the raw images themselves. And if that is done, a better modeling can be done. So let's look at this in detail. So Sean Hatton uh, led a, a multi-site DTI study for Enigma epilepsy, where 24 sites computed uh, fractional isotropy and mean diffusivity uh, from different white matter regions of interest. But if you look at the top left graph there, the distribution of FA across the 24 sites was very different. And the protocols had different voxel sizes, different numbers of diffusion weighted gradients. And so they applied a method called COMBAT, which adjusts the data histograms from each site, or more precisely, the residuals across sites before pooling. And if you do that, you'll see that the, the red data, which is before adjustment, and it's sort of all over the place, is turned into the blue data, which is much more well behaved. And the trends in the data after this sort of adjustment uh, for the site effect or the scanner uh, becomes much uh, easier to identify. So this combat family of methods is very interesting uh, set of methods. Originated in genomics, in fact, microarray expression data, this paper, really good paper by Evan Johnson and colleagues in 2007, explained how if you collect data at multiple sites, or in fact, in batches on multiple occasions, there's a way to adjust the data from each batch so that it's more harmonious. And uh, JP Fortin et al. Uh, in mirror image uh, extended this to diffusion tensor imaging data. And then there's three extensions, uh, combat gam, longitudinal combat, and covbat uh, that adjust um, multi-site data in different ways. Um, I'll tell you a bit about them in a minute. And even most recently distributed combat that can do an adjustment of data uh, remotely uh, to make the data from different sites uh, more comparable. So just to understand what we're, we're doing here and understanding combat, you might be analyzing lots of measures derived from brain images at different sites. The problem is the measures do depend to some extent on the site uh, where the scans were done, either the scanner or the scanner protocol. So even if the exact same people were scanned somewhere else, the mean and the variance of the measures might come out differently. Uh, and even the higher order moments of the data distribution, the skewness and the kurtosis and so on. Now, what we really care about is that the measures depend on biological factors of interest. So it may be age, sex, or disease, or it might be a factor that you want to test. It might be a, a, a marker in the genome, or it might be a treatment. And we don't want those side effects to get in the way or confuse us when we're trying to detect an effect of a treatment. So we'd like to model the effect of sight, uh, or equivalently adjust the data to match a reference distribution. But one very dangerous part of doing this, which you have to be very careful about, is that sites also differ in, in other ways. They differ in the types of people scanned. Uh, patients might have a different disease severity. They might have different inclusion or exclusion criteria, either deliberate or, or just because of the demographics at, at the location of the scanning. And you have to model these two, otherwise these methods often overcorrect uh, the data. And I'll give you some examples of, of why that is bad. So in the basic combat method, which is very, very widely used, let's say you have a cortical thickness measure from site I and participant J for a part of the uh, brain V. Um, you run um, a, a, essentially a regression model that includes a couple of terms. One is um, a, a, essentially a shift factor that shifts the mean of the data um, from a certain site uh, to, to the overall mean of the entire data set. And also a multiplicative factor, delta IV, that scales uh, the residuals of the data to match uh, the, the overall data. So just to give you a recipe for what's done, let's say you have a data set, you um, fit a design matrix, you regress out age and sex and look at the residuals. And just like we showed in the DTI data, these residuals might look a bit different from site to site. So we're going to do what in deep learning is very, very common batch normalization. We're going to shift and scale those residuals to match 
uh, either the whole data set or a, a high quality reference data set. And then after that, we'll add back in the covariates. And if the batch size is very small, there's an empirical Bayes method that shrinks the mean and the variance uh, towards values for the other me measures at that site. You can even fit more elaborate nonlinear models, particularly if you're looking over the lifespan at the uh, trajectories of, of brain measures throughout life. You can piece together a trajectory um, of aging uh, from data that uh, doesn't span much of the lifespan at each site. Um, but also in this case, you are accommodating um, nonlinear uh, differences uh, and also site effects that might be both uh, scaling uh, and shifting of the residuals. And then finally, the sites can also have different covariances in their data. So a scanner can induce or reduce the covariance uh, relative to, to other sites. And um, this really nice method by Andrew Chen and, and, and Haoshan uh, Xu uh, at UPenn um, expands the covariance of the residuals uh, into, in, in fact, a basis. Um, you can do PCA on the um, covariance matrix. And then when you project each site's data onto that basis, uh, you can scale and shift the coefficients in that eigenfunction expansion. So these are all normalizing transforms, a bit like batch normalization in deep learning. And you can uh, shift the site's data, its mean, its covariance, and maybe only the mean needs fixing or higher order moments and uh, just to find out there is actually a test. So this paper, it was very interesting, um, proposes a robust F-test to see which moments of the residual distribution differ at a new batch or site. It could be the mean or the variance, it could be higher order moments. And then it fixes the moments that deviate. And uh, they also in this paper propose the use of a reference batch so that you don't have to correct all the data all over again when new batches uh, get added. So we tried this in Enigma. So Joaquim Radua, who's shown here, um, looked at schizophrenia patients and controls, uh, how big the disease effect is, uh, in this case on cortical morphometry, uh, the thickness of gray matter in the cortex. And he found that using combat boosted the significance and also the effect size of the disease effects because it eliminated some confounding variants, the effects of, of, of site and scanner. And he also improved the basic combat with new and easy to use functions that cope with missing data, and also let you um, run combat on a training data set um, and apply it to another data set, uh, which is an independence requirement uh, in, in machine learning. And just to sort of explain this more, this is work by Vladimir Belov and uh, Roberto Maldonado Goya and the Enigma MDD working group. They've been doing multi-site machine learning for some time, and they show how to apply combat to adjust data within the training set only, and then that becomes a reference where test data's uh, distributional moments, at least of the residuals, uh, can be brought into line with the training data. And then they found that after doing that, um, they're better able to um, make predictions about the test data. Now, this is very popular. Uh, just to look at how the measures look, this is a study by Dylan Sun and Raj Mori in the Enigma PTSD uh, working group. They applied uh, combat, combat GAM uh, to thickness data uh, from many, many sites. Over on the left, you'll see just how different sites are in their mean cortical thickness, uh, even in controls. And after combat and combat GAM, uh, the measures from each site look a little bit more aligned. But there's one caveat. So it lo looks better, but we have to be a little bit careful that this doesn't overcorrect the data if a key influencer or a confound is forgotten in the regression model. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean here. So when Delin and Raj looked at the raw data, uh, the pink data is people with PTSD, the blue data is, is controls. When you run combat, it brings all that pink data on the left sort of more into line. I mean, sites that were reading low for cortical thickness get brought uh, more into line with the rest. But up there at the top, it overcorrects the true nonlinear age effect. And so over on the right combat GAM, which preserves nonlinear uh, age dependencies in the data, it keeps the true nonlinear effect. So if you look at that middle panel, if we were to just naively use combat, um, it would overcorrect the true nonlinearity uh, in the age trajectory just to make everything become linear. And this was also observed by Ray Pomponio in the original combat GAM paper. So Alex Solanis and Joaquim Radua said, well, it, this issue of correcting site data, you can also undercorrect data if there's a site effect in the data and it can be used to predict the outcome. A machine learning approach might lock onto it um, and, and make incorrect and non-generalizable uh, models. And um, this business of there being latent factors at a site that a machine learning algorithm can learn um, is, is a really big issue. They propose when you do multi-site machine learning, you look at the accuracy on each test data by site 
and then regress uh, features of that site uh, out as well to see if there are any interactions between the kind of the data and, and, and the accuracy. And in related work, Richard Dinger and colleagues uh, talk about partitioning the predictive performance of machine learning models on test data uh, into the part that can be explained by confounds, such as the site where the data were collected, and the performance that's independent uh, of confounds. In fact, they, they go as far as to say that you know, the commonest method to adjust data for confounding effects in machine learning is to regress out confounding variables like the effects of site uh, from each input variable. They say that's not really sufficient because there can be things at a site that's lurking in the data that we didn't anticipate. And then the machine learning uh, algorithm can lock onto those uh, in using predictions. So one more advanced way of dealing with this is to use GANs or generative adversarial networks. So this really nice paper by Killian Paul and Qingzhu Zhao at Stanford says that if there's a confounder that affects both the input data uh, and the diagnosis uh, at a site, um, and we start to use machine learning to predict diagnosis from input data, we might end up learning a, a confound. It might be something particular about, about a site. And so because that um, can be locked onto by a, a predictive algorithm, we need to eliminate this spurious association. So they developed an ad adversarial uh, framework with three subnetworks. One subnetwork that chooses features that are independent of the confound uh, by trying to predict the scan site in this in instance from the features. And then a feature extractor that's used for the main task that predicts diagnosis uh, at the same time uh, while being invariant uh, to the site where the data was collected. So these big guns or big guns, so to speak, uh, have been used in a variety of scenarios uh, to correct uh, even raw image data uh, for site effects. And we'll talk a little bit about these. So when you collect data at a new site, the performance of a machine learning algorithm may be catastrophically reduced because the contrast of the new scans differs. So there's a lot of methods that use GANs um, that um, adjust uh, brain images in particular to optimize the overall performance uh, on a task. It might be a prediction or diagnostic task. It might be an image reconstruction task, uh, but also include deconfounding. So Dan Moyer and colleagues um, have been using scanner invariant autoencoders to embed uh, the relevant data for a task uh, into uh, latent space, and then just use uh, features in the latent space uh, where an adversary uh, causes this latent space to be constructed in a way where you can't tell which site the data is coming from. Uh, similar work uh, um, by Nicola Dinsdale and Anna Nambarete uh, has been um, using GANs also to adjust for other confounds. I'll talk about their approach in a minute. And then approaches by Meng Ting Lu and Neda Jahanshah's lab at, at uh, USC and also Lian Rizou and, and Jerry Prince and Aaron Karras. Um, are attempting to synthesize images in a way that is site invariant and adapt them to data from a, a specific site. So let me tell you about this work by, by Dan Moyer, which is, is the first example. He says, you know, rather than worry that the data from a certain site is going to be uh, prejudicing the performance of an algorithm, let, let's shift the data so it looks like it was scanned on a different scanner. It might be the scanner that the algorithm was, was trained on. And to do this, he proposes a scanner invariant variational autoencoder where features in the original image are uh, embedded using a variational autoencoder and the latent space features are used for a predictive task. At the same time, an adversary tries to predict uh, from which site the data came and the parameters of the embedding are adjusted um, iteratively to fool the adversary. And this results in really, really nice approach that uh, produces sightless predictors, predictors that don't depend on the site where the data was collected. But then in the testing configuration, you can recombine it with a site code to actually reconstruct an image as if it had been collected, not on your scanner, but on a different one. Taking this a little bit further, uh, Nicola Dinsdale and Anna Namboretti have been uh, developing CNNs that uh, predict uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, a person's age and so forth. Uh, we call that the main task loss. But they've also been incorporating subnetworks in the deep learning models that try and predict which scanner was used uh, uh, for the different scans. And they try and use features for the prediction that are scanner invariant. So again, this use of an adversary uh, that tries to detect where the data came from, adjust the feature extraction from the data, and then you end up with features that are invariant to the site where the data was collected. They also extended this um, to adjust for other confounds. So if there are known confounds at a site, if the patients are either more severe or they include uh, different kinds of people, um, these also can be used as uh, markers 
uh, to, to guarantee uh, algorithmic fairness. And this can become a very, very elaborate uh, Lagrangian um, you know, multifunctional optimization problem where we can unlearn confounds in data by adjusting feature representations to make it very, very difficult to predict uh, the confounds. One really cool development by uh, the Hopkins group uh, essentially um, adjusts uh, scans to have any given contrast. And so one of the nice things about this is if you have multi-site data here from uh, eight different sites, you can adjust the scans using a, a parametrically variable controllable subspace where each site's data lives in a certain zone. It looks a little bit like TSNI or UMAP if, if uh, you're familiar with those methods. And then you have ultimate control on what you would like your scan data to look like. And there's a great deal of um, simultaneous optimization here. You would also like this data to uh, uh, do well on predictive tasks. And you'd also like to avoid geometric uh, shift where the, the derived features from the scans are uh, impaired by making the adjustment. So this is a very exciting new work um, called Calamity as, uh, is, is the name of the algorithm. Now, does this work? And it, it, it does. So this is work by Sobhi Sinha here, here at, at USC, where she's been applying attention uh, guided GANs uh, to neuroimaging data. Uh, this is cycle GAN setup and showing that uh, the corrected data um, achieves better performance on a, on a task here, uh, Alzheimer's disease classification. And so this was in the end successful. There's also another way to do machine learning on multi-site data, federated learning. So there's whole Mikai workshops on this. One really beautiful example by Spiros Bakas, uh, the, the FETS uh, initiative, and there's even a challenge at Mikai on this, uh, involves 55 collaborating sites across the uh, globe that uh, are trying to do uh, brain tumor segmentation. And they, rather than send data around, uh, send um, models uh, to each site. And depending on the topology of, of learning, these can either cycle around the sites or have iterative exchange of coefficients with a, 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 a um, central controller. And this has been a really superb way of learning from all of the available data, even when the data is non-IID. In other words, it's not identically distributed uh, at each site. Uh, work by Dimitri Strepilis uh, here, here at USC has shown that uh, federated deep learning uh, often outperforms learning on one site's data. I mean, in this test, just to predict the person's age from T1-weighted MRI, uh, the, the green curve there shows the mean absolute error of a federated algorithm uh, versus um, individual learners that are based at each site and they have much higher error and they don't even converge uh, very well. So in the final three minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about how these methods are being tested in Enigma. So um, one really great project uh, for automated uh, diagnosis of ADHD and autism spectrum disorder based on multimodal imaging is being led by uh, Yan Li Zhang James. Um, she has observed that compared to most of the studies in the literature, um, the Enigma multi-site data is obviously a much larger sample. But at the same time, the performance is worse. And so this won't surprise many of you. Um, algorithms trained on data from one or at least a, a small number of sites uh, tends to be a little bit optimistic in its uh, classification uh, error. And she's found that as you add data from 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 people, uh, the validation loss actually becomes uh, better um, and the overtraining uh, it isn't as severe. But obviously, given these curves, we need more data. But even with the existing data, she's found really nice uh, rankings of different uh, classical uh, machine learning and, and deep learning methods, uh, actually showing that VAEs are, are very useful even on discrete derived numeric uh, summary data. They're very, very useful um, in distilling uh, principal factors uh, from the data for this uh, task. Uh, you can use multimodal data, uh, Shiju, Raj Mori, and Yuval Neria, uh, uh, classifying PTSD based on MRI diffusion data and resting state data, all uh, distilled with harmonized protocols. And they also find that uh, uh, VAEs, variational autoencoders, are very, very good at embedding this data in a way to produce uh, stable and robust uh, predictors. So just to wrap up, um, multi-site clinical neuroimaging is now enabling uh, global studies of uh, over 30 different brain disorders. In the case where the signal is very, very tiny, where you're searching for markers in the genetic code that might be associated with brain images, um, you can even do this in over 50,000 MRIs. And in that case, using meta-analysis, it's just fine. You can find uh, these very subtle effects on the brain by doing that. But often for multi-site machine learning, um, one of the pernicious issues of using data from different sites is 
your algorithm can learn something uh, about the data at a certain site that won't generalize well. It might be a site-specific confound either in the protocol used or the kinds of patients assessed. And that can lead to very, very poor uh, performance when the algorithms are tested on data from a new site. So you'll see both linear regression be confounding such as combat, and then these more uh, complex methods such as scanner invariant autoencoders or GANs, uh, they can often disentangle the site invariant uh, features, the ones we care about, from the ones that are circumstantial, such as the protocol used or the kinds of people uh, that are assessed. But that isn't to say that we can get away with um, just using these methods. We do need to train and test our methods on very, very diverse data, ideally from across the world, uh, from people of different uh, ethnic backgrounds and different cultures, uh, to make sure that we've seen the full space of biological variation uh, that, that is found in reality. So do join us if you want to join in with Enigma, if you have a good method that you want to try on multi-site data, you can go to our website and find uh, projects that might interest you. You're very welcome to join in. And a big thank you to all of the folks that have made Enigma possible for the last uh, uh, 11 years. As you can see, very, very diverse regions around the globe are contributing analytic uh, and data uh, uh, to, to this, uh, to this uh, aggregate effort. And thanks to the funders, uh, particularly to NIH, but also to uh, funders around the world that have made Enigma's uh, efforts uh, possible. I just want to end with a quote about meta-analysis. So uh, Aristotle, um, in his metaphysics uh, some time ago, um, said, uh, individually, we contribute little to the quest for truth, but working together the whole vast world of science is within our reach. And I'd, I'd like to think this is the first call for meta-analysis. He says, ek panton de sunathroid zominon binastai ti megatos, after uh, piling all of these things up, my Greek isn't very good, uh, something great uh, will emerge. And so I think that's the first uh, advocate of meta-analysis and multi-site uh, science, at least that I have seen. So again, thanks to the organizers, really, really appreciate uh, being invited today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to uh, have the chance to talk with you. Uh, thank you very much.